welcome to um, our hearing today. It is four o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with today's Recreation and Parks Committee public hearing. Um, I am joined by my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Shayla Favor, um, and I know Councilmember Emmanuel Remy is getting on in a second here. Thank you so much for participating today. We're here to review the city's urban forestry master plan. And the plan lays out the strategic and long-term investment in Columbus's urban tree canopy. A healthy tree canopy provides um, improvements to air quality. It prevents erosion and storm runoff. It reduces the urban heat island effect and lowers utility bills for residents helps mitigate the impacts of climate change and simply makes our city a healthier and more beautiful place to live. Preserving and expanding our tree canopy in every single neighborhood is a critical investment for the future of our city, especially for neighborhoods that really need additional tree coverage the most. Um, and I wanna highlight that there's been incredible resident engagement in this process. There's been incredible, I'm sorry, folks, um, there has been incredible um, participation really over time among our residents. And then here today, we have 22 um, people signed up for public comment. So we are really excited to get things underway. You can tell Maribel is particularly excited. Um, and I'm gonna start by handing things over to Director Lakoski of Recreation and Parks um, for a high, uh, high level overview. Thank you so much, President Pro Tem and uh, Council Members Remy and Favor. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to get in front of uh, City Council and the public to talk about all the good work that's occurred uh, over the period of time we've been working on our planning effort and our study. You know, over the last year and a half, uh, our staff and our nationally recognized consultants have drafted the city's first urban forestry master plan. And this plan will serve as a blueprint for, uh, to prioritize, preserve, and grow Columbus's trees. Our department has engaged a broad group of stakeholders to understand the community's priorities for our urban forestry, received hundreds of comments that inform this plan. The analyses and operations review conducted in the planning process showed us that we have a lot of room for progress and growth. And, and we knew that we would encounter that and we're, we're happy to embrace that. Uh, we have uh, identified some steps moving forward. We uh, now have a unified uh, vision for Columbus's urban forest that both the community and the city can work towards. Uh, we feel that the three goals we identified for our tree canopy are the right ones based on extensive analysis and public support. With increased coordination, the application of best practices, dedicated resources, and strong policies, we're confident we can create an urban forest that will benefit our residents for generations to come. I would like to remind everyone that we are in the public comment period and it closes uh, on 3-31-2021. Uh, we will take time to review the comments. Uh, we'll adjust the urban forestry master plan as needed. And then we plan to come to council in April for a resolution of support. We appreciate the $1 million investment that has already been made for the urban forestry master plan uh, implementation. And we plan to use these funds to buy forestry equipment, prepare sites for planting uh, through tree removals and stump grindings and purchase trees. Our department will continue to build our operating and capital budgets to support the urban forestry master plans recommendation. And I wanted to give a special thanks to City Council and uh, the Mayor, uh, our two consultants, Davey uh, and Urban Canopy Works, and of course to Rosalie Hendon, who's been the lead on our side of the project and has done such a, a fine job bringing this all uh, to this point. And with that, uh, I will uh, turn it over to uh, back to you, President Pro Tem. If there's any questions, I can answer those now or as they come up, and uh, we'll look forward to Rosalie's Great. presentation. Thank you so much, um, Director Rakowski, and we're glad you'll you'll be on hand. I think some of the questions of Rachel and Rosalie um, may may end up relating back to you. But um, for now, we're going to proceed to hear an overview of the tree canopy analysis and findings, um, as well as an overview of that public engagement process that I spoke about at the top of the hearing. 
um, from the consultants who worked with the city on this plan. So our presenters are Rachel um, Comte with Urban Canopy Works and Carrie Gray with Davy Resource Group. The floor is yours. All right, Rosalie, did you did you want to start off, or should I? Where are Take you? Get away, Rachel. We're Okay, we're gonna okay, just the effort. Okay, we're gonna speed through. All right. So my name, uh, like you said, my name is uh, Rachel Comte. I'm an urban planner and arborist with Urban Canopy Works. Hired together with Carrie Gray of Davy Resource Group and our local partner too. I also wanted to mention is designing local. Matt Leisure with designing local was a key part of our local um, outreach and the plan overall. So I wanted to give a shout out to him. Uh, one of the first questions we get asked is, why are we doing this plan? Um, <clears throat> if Carrie, you want to go to the next slide? So uh, first, let me clarify what an urban forest actually is. It's simply all the trees within an urban area, publicly and privately owned, all together. We use that term frequently, but I think we need to acknowledge that the broader community doesn't always know what that means. So I think we wanted to clarify that in the beginning. So back to the question of why we're doing this, and it's really because of the challenges facing Columbus currently. Already today, Columbus has been cited as one of the fastest growing heat islands in the country. Heat island obviously means significantly hotter. This leads to higher energy demand and costs and worsening air pollution. These higher temperatures also contribute to heat related deaths and illnesses, respiratory issues, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Columbus has experienced air quality issues um, and high infant mortality rates, high rates of chronic conditions, including obesity, diabetes, and asthma, all of which impact overall community health. Add to these current stresses the knowledge that uh, Columbus is expecting exponential growth in the coming decades, another million people in the region as a whole by um, 2050 is expected. Add on top of that, the climate is expecting to continue to warm, droughts, storm, heat stress, all of that is expected to continue. And on top of that, we also know that we currently have a low tree canopy cover. We're at 22% right now, and that is the amount of tree canopy that covers the land when you're looking at a view from above. So think Google aerial view, how much of the city is covered by trees um, when you can see it in the summer months when the leaves are on. Uh, Carrie will talk about more, talk more about this in a minute. And that the other, the final thing is that the canopy, were you gonna say something? Oh. Yeah, I was actually, get, I was gonna ask just real quick, fastest growing heat island in the country. Um, we are, are um, fastest growing, like getting the hottest, or um, our our economy is the fastest growing of cities with heat island problems. Do you see what I'm saying? Is Where's the distinction there? Or which side of the line do we fall on? Rosie, did you want to? Yeah, um, thanks, President Pro Tem, for asking about that. We're the fastest growing, meaning from when they started to measure summer uh, heat and those 90 degree days, that uh, Columbus, you know, we're increasing the fastest compared to the other 60 cities studied nationally. So we don't have the worst heat island. Um, we were eight out of 60, but we have the fastest growing. So, you know, it's important for us to act now um, to, to really impact that increase in uh, heat and stress for our residents. Thanks. Thank you. Makes sense. You can go ahead. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, and the final thing I wanted to bring up, add to the fact that the canopy that we do have is not equitably distributed across the uh, communities and the neighborhoods within Columbus. Canopy cover ranges um, between neighborhoods from as low as 9% to as high as 41%. And this means that some neighborhoods are receiving more benefits from trees that positively affect health and well-being than other neighborhoods. All of this has significant quality of life implica implications and a solid tree canopy as part of the solution to keeping Columbus more resilient. Uh, trees play a key role in alleviating, alleviating a lot of these issues. They're one of the most effective ways to reduce heat island, heat island effects. They remove much of the street level air pollutants. These two together have major impacts on public health and quality of life. They do a lot in reducing stormwater runoff um, 
And we know that even people shop longer and spend more in business districts with trees versus without. Property values are higher with trees versus without, and the list goes on and on. And we've detailed those in the plan. We don't, you know, in the effort of time, in that, um, I don't want to go into all of those. I could spend a whole presentation just talking about those, but I did want to point out that the 22% tree canopy cover, which was assessed in 2013, um, provides approximately $38 million in benefits to the city of Columbus each year. And these are only the benefits we can qualify. There's a lot of qualitative benefits in there as well, and that is not included in that number. So because of the high value of um, these benefits, cities across the country are now recognized trees as critical city infrastructure. And this is a plan to proactively care for, improve, and manage that infrastructure. Here you go to the next one. So the work that went into this plan, and there was a lot of it, um, we uh, have a, oh, excuse me, I lost my place here. Um, we analyze the existing data. We have two main sets of data. So that's a tree inventory. And then canopy data, uh, Carrie's going to talk about that in a minute. We also did a review of internal operations, so forestry operations, equipment, staff, that kind of thing. We reviewed and incorporated existing plans in place. We looked at regulations and code. We benchmark a lot of this data to other cities to see how Columbus compares. We obviously incorporated urban forestry best practices that Carrie and I know from doing this work in other cities throughout the country. And then we did an additional analysis, one on social equity and one on planting, which I believe Carrie's going to talk about as well. And then we, um, like you said, we talked to, interacted, and listened with the community. So I'm going to talk about that for a second. <clears throat> um, we had a project team in place. We had some community advisory groups um, that was about 30 people uh, that served as a steering committee. And we also had an advisory group of more than 100 people representing city, county, nonprofits, area commissions, um, green industry, developers, academia, utilities. It was a large group. We also um, had an open house. Thank goodness we got in right under the wire before COVID hit. So we were able to actually have an in-person open house. We were very excited about that. We did have an uh, online comment form we got over 300 comment forms uh, through our website, columbusufmp.org. Uh, Rosalie did also um, present at small groups. So we went to where people are instead of just asking them to come talk, you know, come to us to discuss these, uh, these topics and these issues. And then we did a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews throughout the project as well. So you can go to the next one. And what we heard from the community, we nine themes emerged from all of those conversations that we had also this is in the plan so there's more there's more there's background of, of behind each of these but number one the consensus was that we are not where we should be um that we've you know we're behind in the data that we have the canopy cover that we have all sorts of things the sentiment was we're not where we should be knowledge and awareness of the value of trees uh is is lacking Better management's needed, more tree protections needed. We need to focus on equity to improve canopy. There's a lack of resources and uh, the data is old. Um, we need to encourage planting and preservations on private property as well. And there is also challenges that were brought up repeatedly about dealing with uh, rentals and landlords versus homeowners and, and getting buy-in for a tree canopy. Um, and this map you see, this is a map of um, those that we heard from that came to the open house. And so it was a good geographic distribution um, of, of folks in Columbus that came to the open house. And Carrie will uh, talk to us about some of the findings through this analysis. And then Rosalie will talk to us about the next steps. Thanks, Rachel. So um, I'm Carrie Gray. I'm a principal consultant with Davy Resource Group. So part of the project team, as you heard, that developed the urban forestry master plan for Columbus. Um, so I'm just going to discuss the findings from the plan. We had 18 findings and I'm just going to really highlight some of the major findings within the plan. So the first one is that the tree data is out of date. So you heard Rachel mention things about the urban tree canopy assess the assessment and the amount of tree canopy cover that's in Columbus. Um, and an urban tree canopy assessment is an assessment that measures the amount of tree canopy from viewed from above. So it uses aerial imagery to look at the different land classifications in the city. The map on the right actually shows um, the existing land cover in Columbus based on that urban tree canopy assessment. 
So industry standard recommends that these are completed every five to 10 years. So the low end of five years is if there is an insect or disease that may have impacted your urban forest, um, or if there is development pressures, both of which Columbus is experiencing. So we all know the damage that the Emerald Ash Borer has done within the community um, with ash trees, and that's all happened really over the last um, 10 to 15 years. So the urban tree canopy assessment that was done um, uses 2013 aerial imagery. So as I mentioned, the image on the right is actually the map that shows canopy cover. So the areas that are in red are those impervious surfaces, so roads, buildings, and sidewalks, so those things that really contribute to the urban heat island. And the areas that are dark green on the map are the areas that have tree canopy cover. The second data source the city has is a public tree inventory. And so the tree inventory is done by actually having an arborist go out and walk the streets and measure each tree identifying the species, size, condition, maintenance needs of those particular trees. So the city completed a, a street tree inventory in 1997, and industry standard recommends that that's completed every 10 years. So Columbus at this point is over 20 years due for a complete urban, um, a complete public tree inventory update. So in terms of tree canopy cover, you heard Rachel mention that uh, Columbus has 22%. So a lot of times people want to know, so where do we compare with other communities? So obviously lots of things are taken into consideration in terms of communities, but we looked at some communities in Ohio, and then we also looked at some regionally, you know, in the Midwest and close to Columbus. Um, so we, we can see that Columbus has less tree canopy cover than peer cities, um, except for Cleveland. We also noted that 70% of the canopy cover is on private property, while 30% is on public property. This is pretty standard for most communities, the majority of an urban forest or where that true canopy growing is on private property. So another finding was that the available resources to manage and care for Columbus's trees is not sufficient. So this, uh, we're looking at two different graphs. The one on the top right is the annual budget spent per tree based on a 2014 National Survey of Municipal Urban Forestry Programs. And that found that the annual per, per tree spending in Columbus is 20% um, lower, or 20% 20, 20 lower than other Midwest cities and 38% lower than the national average. When we look at staffing um, using the same data set, Columbus's forestry staff manages more trees per staff person um, at almost 7,600 trees um, per staff person than the national average out of about 4,800 trees. Um, as we mentioned, Columbus's tree inventory data is out of date, and the city has started to do some inventory updates in some neighborhoods. And what we're finding is that there's actually more trees on the street. So these numbers are actually um, going to be, you know, they're going to be less per tree spending and actually more trees per staff person. So, you know, there's a real um, issue with available resources in order to manage and care for Columbus's trees. What was also mentioned was um, a lot of growth going on and a lot of development in Columbus. And we looked at uh, Columbus's tree ordinance um, and identified that there were not adequate protections, um, tree protection and preservation policies in place. So we actually did a comparison looking at two neighboring communities. So we wanted to pick some communities that are nearby um, to provide the opportunity to actually go and see how those tree protection and preservation ordinances are working in practice. And then we also looked at Charlotte, North Carolina, because it's a peer city, similar size to Columbus and similar development pressures. So you can see that column that's on the far left um, of that is um, shows Columbus um, and the other three communities. And you can see these are different tree protection and preservation regulations. And you can see that Columbus is, um, doesn't have very strong re like regulations when it comes to uh, preservation and protection of trees on private property. So there's no requirement for a tree inventory, any kind of tree protection regulations as part of development and site plans. The city does have public tree protection, so there are protections in place to preserve or to preserve and protect public trees, but it's really lacking um, for the private tree protection. And this is really kind of unusual for a city the size of Columbus. So we did have a, um, you heard Rachel um, talk about kind of social equity and our 
looking at the urban tree canopy data and identifying that tree canopy cover really isn't equitably distributed across neighborhoods in Columbus. So we did a social equity analysis where we looked at economic, social, and demographic factors um, and developed a social equity index. So we use these nine factors that were selected by the stakeholder project team um, that we engaged during the entire process. Um, and we developed an actual social equity index. So we took all the data from these different um, factors and put them together into one index. So the higher the number of social equity index in a neighborhood was the higher need in that neighborhood. So the map on the right hand side is called a bivariate map and it's actually mapping um, on the Y axis. So up here it's mapping the tree canopy cover from low to high. And on the x-axis over here, it's mapping the social equity index from low to high. So the areas of most concern and the areas that are highlighted in red and maroon and pink on the slide are the areas of the city that have high social equity need and low or moderate tree canopy cover. So this is just another kind of visualization of that same um, data set. And so it, this is all in the plan. So if you wanna dive a little bit deeper, it's all in the planning documents, um, but it looks at um, the neighborhoods and it shows each neighborhood and they're sorted alphabetically. Um, and it shows their in tree um, equity index, social equity index score, and then the amount of tree canopy cover. So this really is gonna help the city to prioritize, prioritize tree care, planting and planning in these areas of highest social equity need. So that concludes um, my portion of the presentation and now we're gonna um, open it up for any questions. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great overview and there, as anyone who's watching can tell, um, there is so much good information contained um, and also, you know, clear proof that we've got a lot of work to do in Columbus. Um, before we move on to Rosalie, I did want to give a chance um, for uh, my colleagues who are here to ask any questions um, of the presenters or Director Rakowski's fair game the whole hearing. You can ask him questions anytime. Um, and I know I see Councilmember Remy and Councilmember Faber, um, or if anyone else has joined, feel free to pipe in too. Any questions? All right, we will move right along then to um, Rosalie Hendon uh, with Recreation and Parks. And Rosalie will provide an overview of where we go from here, essentially. So Rosalie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, President Pro Tem uh, Brown. It's a pleasure to be with you and Council Members Favor and Remy. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Really excited to talk with you today. Uh, so I'm going, the consultants really set us up to be talking about the, um, where we are today. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure. Okay. Uh, where we are today in Columbus, and I'm going to talk about where do we go from here. So collectively with our stakeholder group, with our project team, we came up with this vision for Columbus's urban forest. That is to prioritize, preserve, and grow the tree canopy in Columbus equitably across neighborhoods to improve health and quality of life for all residents. And I really like to draw your attention to those three verbs, prioritize, preserve, and grow. And something that we've learned through this planning process is it's not just about planting trees. Planting trees is absolutely so important and we want to grow our canopy, but we also wanna preserve the canopy that we have. Those trees are already providing benefits to residents. And we also want to be prioritizing and giving value to trees because we've heard of all the benefits that they're providing uh, and improving our quality of life and recognizing that they are critical infrastructure that actually uh, increases in value over time. So out of that vision, we've developed three goals and uh, I'll go through them with you. The first goal is to reach 40% canopy citywide. As you've heard, we're currently at 22% in Columbus, so that's a, practically doubling the canopy. It's very ambitious. Um, this is a goal that we are very confident, um, both from the analysis side and also from public input. This was something that uh, over 70% of our advisory group supported, and they felt it was critical to, in, to uh, ensuring that generations to come have a high quality of life in Columbus. Our other two goals are shorter term. Our second goal is to stop net canopy loss. 
by 2030. Again, we want to grow, but we understand we can't grow if we are losing. And so really taking a hard look at uh, all of the reasons, you know, Carrie mentioned the emerald ash borer, pests, disease, storm, mortality, all these things are affecting our forests. Um, and, and of course, we're growing as well, and so there are pressures from development as well. So really looking at stopping net canopy loss so we can then increase our canopy. And finally, investing in equitable canopy across all neighborhoods by 2030. And the term there, invest, again, going back to the idea that planting is important, but so is taking care of what we have and making sure we understand what is there. Uh, with our tree data so out of date, um, I see it as a really important way uh, to approach our neighborhoods more equitably by having that updated information so that then we can be more proactive in going after um, planting spaces and uh, tree care needs in all neighborhoods and not just ones that are requesting. And so we have four strategies, 15 action steps listed in the plan. It's a lot of detail. Um, so I'm gonna go through very high level with you. This first strategy is around community coordination and collaboration. And the very first action step is something uh, we're really excited about. And it's the idea of creating a Columbus Tree Coalition. Cleveland has a Cleveland Tree Coalition that's been instrumental in advocating for their urban forest and has kind of been a place where all of the players can come together and work together around tree canopy goals for the entire city. Columbus has a lot of partners that are doing incredible work when it comes to trees. Uh, but we don't yet have a place where all of these groups can come together and that can serve as a forum for unifying those efforts. So um, that's the idea there. The messaging and education we heard from public input that there needed to be more emphasis on sharing out the value of trees um, and, and reducing those barriers and understanding, you know, um, what, what challenges there might be. Improving communication and collaboration is important as well. That's both within the city. Uh, everyone knows New Columbus is a large city. We've got a lot of departments, a lot of folks working, especially in the right of way. And so it's really important for us to be, uh, you know, coordinating uh, around that, especially, you know, street trees, but any way, any way that we're touching public trees. And also working uh, to communicate better with our residents and really be sharing out uh, the next one, sharing tree data. So making that more accessible, we created an interactive canopy map throughout the course of this project. And I think that's the way that we need to go is making all of these tools, all of this analysis that we've done as part of this project even more accessible so that uh, again, supporting all of those tree projects that are already happening on the ground. And then finally, we want to continue to engage and encourage volunteers and partner organizations when it comes to public tree care. Our second strategy is around best practices. So going back to that equity analysis, we, we have not, as a city, had a long-term planting plan. So the idea here is that we should be developing a socially equitable planting plan, perhaps for five years, maybe even for 10, but understanding where we are going strategically around the city when it comes to street and park tree planting. Um, I don't mean to suggest that we would stop responding to resident requests, but our current uh, model has been more focused on resident requests and this would kind of give a uh, more strategic approach uh, in planning forward. Ensuring space for trees is an important best practice. Uh, as you're probably aware, large trees are providing a lot more benefit to residents than small trees. And yet Columbus is a small class city. We have a lot of narrow tree lawns or even areas where there's no space to plant trees. And the smaller the space, the smaller the tree, you know, a large tree is not gonna do well in a small amount of growing space. So as much as possible, uh, if we can get ahead of, you know, new developments, making sure that there's large tree lawns, lots of growing space to support large shade trees, that's important. But also in existing neighborhoods, are there opportunities to retrofit and, and add back in that growing space to support a larger canopy? I mentioned how forestry has been uh, much more reactive in the past, and uh, that, that goes back to the resource discussion that we had. But really transitioning to proactive care and understanding uh, the data is kind of an initial step to that, understanding where the needs are and reacting 
or, or not reacting, I'm sorry, acting ahead of time um, and making sure, you know, trees are a long-lived asset and they need routine maintenance and they need uh, that care for us to be providing as well as, um, you know, planting. And then finally, uh, Moving on, the Urban Forestry Best Practices Manual is an idea that came out of discussions with other city departments. They were really interested in having one place where all of the policies and standards uh, could exist so that they could understand uh, what the forestry needs were for Columbus and just one document. So that's ambitious, uh, but we're very excited about creating that sort of resource both for the city and for the community. And finally, this is an adaptive management plan. So we will be needing to measure our progress and reassess next steps uh, so that we can adapt to changing circumstances. We've talked about resources some already. And to that end, uh, we're looking at supplemental funding sources. We've already had some success with federal grant dollars. Um, we're looking at the newly created Recreation and Parks Foundation as a partner in this effort. Uh, but we're also interested eventually in a street tree assessment. This has been, uh, a, or it's also called a frontage assessment. It's a way that other Ohio cities have funded their forestry efforts, such as Cincinnati and Toledo. So that we know that'll be a, a larger project, but it's something we're very interested in as well. I mentioned uh, about forestry. They've been extremely focused on operations, the day-to-day -day operations. And throughout this planning process, we've recognized that there is a need within forestry to have high-level planning and coordination. So we're we'll looking at restructuring our leadership in forestry to be able to provide that as well as um, operations focus. And then finally, you've heard about the tree data. This image is uh, of our public tree inventory. And it's critical that we both update both sources, the urban tree canopy assessment and the public tree inventory, but that we also have a cycle, you know, to regularly update that data and so that it continues to be a value for our management and for the community. Finally, our last strategy is to create stronger policies. You've heard already that Columbus lacks a citywide private tree protection. Um, and that is going to be critical. I see that as critical to going back to our goal about no net loss. Um, we know that that will be its own process and we'll need to have its own engagement uh, and stakeholders uh, reaching out, but we're excited to be building on the stakeholder uh, engagement that we've already had and, and to continue. And then finally, the public tree ordinance. There are certain things that we should be requiring, uh, even though we already do have the ordinance, there's ways that it should be improved. Finally, I'd like to share some next steps with you. As Director Rakowski mentioned, we are in the public comment period. Anyone who's watching, I uh, would encourage you, please send us your feedback. The way to do that is online at columbusufmp.org. And you can download the two documents there, the draft master plan and the accompanying technical report, and you can submit comments directly online. Um, we, uh, and we so appreciate Council for hosting this hearing for us is another way to get the word out uh, in this last week here of public comments. Next month, we're planning on going to the Recreation and Parks Commission and receiving a vote to support the master plan, as well as returning to council for resolution of support also in April so that we can officially begin implementation in May of this year. That concludes my presentation. Again, thank you so much. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Rosalie. Are there any questions um, from my colleagues at, at this time? Councilman Marini. Thank you, President Pro Tem Brown. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Rosalie and Carrie and Rachel for your presentations. Of course, the director, um, Paul, and I see Mr. Uton here as well. Uh, I, so looking at the uh, plan, what, when is the goal for the 40%, you know, the long range goal? What is the anticipated, you know, what, what's likely, what's realistic? If we worked extra hard, when would we get there? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, thanks for that question, Council Member Remy. That's a question that we've asked ourselves many times and our stakeholders. Um, it's hard to predict and Rachel and Carrie feel free to, to weigh in 
we've asked the same question, you know, what is a realistic amount to increase each year? You know, can we somehow model, you know, what, again, what's ambitious but realistic? And uh, I've been told it's, it's somewhat difficult to do that. That said, um, we have been discussing internally because I get this question a lot. It is a little bit unusual to ha not have a year on our overall goal because the question is then how are you measuring your progress? So we are in discussion um, and we'll be looking at the comment period as well to get some good indication about what might be a realistic um, time frame. And, uh, but at the minimum, I think we would say several decades to be, uh, you know, essentially doubling our tree canopy, but um, definitely still in discussion about that and happy to receive comment around that time frame as well. And I would add too, um, one of the points of that was um, a data point that's interesting is to increase the canopy by 1%. I can't remember the acreage exactly. I think it's 17 or 1800 acres of new canopy is needed to add 1% to give you a sense of how big that is. That is the size of the OSU campus. And that assumes that there's no loss also. So it is a big lift to get to 40%. So we were, you know, lots of discussions and, and lots of different thoughts and do we put something in that's we know we can get there or do we put something where we want to get but it might take us longer you know it was a it was back and forth so i mean you know this this goes hand in hand you know i, I had the climate action plan um hearing and in, in a couple of weeks ago and of course that public comment period is still going on but this you know is very complimentary and helping to achieve some of those goals and and so you know depending on how aggressively we tackle this you know it, it does have have an impact i know that i've talked with you director about um inc increasing some staffing using some funding to create a new arborist team um i think i believe if correct me if i'm wrong or Roy, you can you can sit correctly but we're about three years behind in our tree maintenance obviously um there are some programs like New York City's program where they have, you know, citizen arborists basically that they they uh, rec some parks in their organization help train people on how to do this. But you know, these are things that that we really need to look at today, you know, versus longer term. I mean, the, the, those are things that we could work on immediately. So I would like to have you guys comment a little bit on that, if you would. Council uh, Member Remy, as you can imagine, this is going to take a large effort on multiple fronts in order for us to address the issues that we have here and, and, to, and to play that catch up. I think, again, it's, it's, there's two pieces of this. One is funding. Uh, you, you've talked about funding. Obviously, the more funding that we can apply to this, the quicker that we get to the goal. Uh, the other is the policy changes. Uh, there's a, you know, the, the vast majority of, uh, of what we're looking at here is, is private property. Uh, we're going to have to make policy changes in order to protect and grow those trees on, uh, on, the, on private property. There is a, a point of diminishing returns in regard to what we can do on public property, regardless of the amount of funds that we would put towards this. So, I think the balanced approach in using all of these strategies that, that we've identified in the report or the way that we're going to make, uh, you know, shorten that period of time. Um, we do need to increase our pruning crews. There's a couple of things that we'd like to do right off the bat. Obviously, we're, we're, we're happy to have this million dollars that we were uh, granted in the capital budget. You know, it's, it's two different strategies. The capital budget is you know, remove the hazardous trees, identify uh, sites and prep sites for planting and plant trees. And then the operating side is more of the maintenance, protection, care of the trees. So they both have to really go hand in hand. It's about a million dollars, I think, per crew that's with equipment. Um, one of our other challenges is we need a, a location to house the crews. So we think we can do one crew pretty quickly and have an ability to house the crew. Then we're going to have to do some work on our current facilities, you know, capital work to expand, expand the ability to house equipment, to house our crews. Uh, but we are going to look at all of those issues. We're going to look at, uh, that's a great idea about the, 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 the civilian tree pruning crew. And with Troy and I have talked about that, we, we're definitely going to embrace that as well. 
Thank you, Director. I, th and then one other thing, you know, I think that there's, you know, I just want to point this out. There's work to be done internally, working cross-departmentally. We don't have a policy, for instance, in economic development when we're approving uh, projects of tree replacement necessarily. And but certainly that's something that I've started as chair of economic development. But I, I, I've asked, you know, what, what ratio are you going to replace these trees with? You're taking mature trees down. What, you know, what, what's the return going to be as you're doing this construction? But we have to have those conversations. Similarly, with refuse, for instance, uh, we approved on Monday night um, some technology that, that can help with inventory and finding broken trees, et cetera. The technology looks like we could do that. The only, the only city vehicles that travel every single street in the city every week is, are trash trucks. And so, you know, what are the synergies there? What can we do to capitalize on the fact that they're out there so that, you know, makes our lives easier in recs and parks and make making sure that we have a, a healthy community. So um, I just put that out there because we, we need to challenge internally uh, ourselves uh, to make this work uh, even even more efficiently. So uh, thanks, President Brown. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Council Member. I think those are really important points. And I know um, that a key part of um, even coming up with the strategies was to talk to other departments. And um, and I appreciate that. And I think that your point, Council Member, is that we need to continue to collaborate with other departments, you know, as we go about this really ambitious effort. Um, we, you know, can't stop at the point of plan development. Um, and so thank you uh, for that. Um, if there are no other questions, I am gonna move into public comment. So uh, speak now if you have a question. Um, but otherwise, we have a thrilling 22 speakers that have signed up for public comment. So we're going to move into that. And I'm going to call speakers in the order they signed up. Again, there are 22 total. Um, we give speakers three minutes. And um, I really hate to like sound like the school teacher or the school mom or whatever. But we're going to be strict about the three minutes because this is well over an hour of, or it's over an hour of, um, of public comment. And so we really want to respect people's time um, and make sure that um, our speakers are speaking for no more than three minutes. Um, and I, I will say that we really welcome any written comments too. Um, so if you feel that there was something you weren't able to say and want to follow up written, um, my email address is ecbrown at columbus.gov, and, and we really welcome that. So we are going to start with Tim Asher and um, Nathan Johnson, you are on deck. So uh, Mr. Asher, are you there? Uh, I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, just feel free to cut me off whenever. Um, so first of all, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. I, um, I run a small tree service here in Columbus, Ohio. I've been working with uh, an urban forester here in Columbus for uh, about 10 years now, and I also work with a nonprofit called the Urban Tree Project, uh, which is goals to, to increase tree cover uh, in Central Ohio as well. That being said, I wanted to use my three minutes specifically on the uh, theme four in the Urban Forestry Master Plan, which is uh, there are not, not enough tree protection measures in place. And so, you know, and Rosalie had talked about uh, here today, we can't grow if we are losing. So that's sort of what I wanted to talk about in my, in my three minutes. Um, just at having worked in the past 10 years here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, in urban tree care, you know, I, I climb trees, I, you know, I remove tree, I remove hazard trees when necessary, I do a lot of plant health care, uh, you know, we're, we're full, kind of a full service operation. In the past decade, mechanized equipment has entered Columbus in uh, crane work, uh, very large storm debris trucks that can hold 40, you know, 20 to 40,000 pounds of material, um, which is great for the worker, it's great for your back, it's great for being able to efficiently do a job. It's, it's great for a consumer in that removals a decade ago, a backyard removal might have been six thousand dollars. Now that removal somewhere, you know, could be in the neighborhood of a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars because this mechanized equipment has so changed the game of how easy it is to remove trees. And I and I feel like sort of a low hanging fruit, an early low hanging fruit would be tree protection measures on a private scale. It's 
just today, I, I learned of a large sugar maple removal in a backyard of a client of mine that somebody knocked on her door, said it was rotten. Um, she got scared, had the tree removed then and there, so now that tree is gone. Uh, and there's, there's no licensing requirement for a boar culture in Columbus. Uh, there's no permitting process for removing any tree. So anyone to pick up and knock on a door, say this tree is diseased, someone is scared, they remove that tree. When you add mechanized equipment, even good, reputable companies can remove trees at a rate that is, I mean, it's quite honestly astounding what the difference in a decade has been. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's not, which again is great for the consumer, great for the, the tree, the, the, you know, the, the, the back of the tree worker, but it's, it's, uh, it's detrimental for, you know, if we're going to actually protect trees here in Columbus, uh, current trees, I think a low, a low hanging, easy fruit would be that, um, either a licensing requirement for what I, you need a license to braid hair. You don't need a license to cut down a tree. Um, I am a certified licensed arborist. I, I don't have to be, I, I choose to be, you know, I, I have a master's, uh, I teach a culture at Columbus state. It's these are things I choose to do, but I don't have to do any of those things. And I can tell a person whatever I want. Uh, a company can tell a person whatever they want. That tree comes down. It's so much easier to do than it used to be. It's only going to continue to get easier. There's grapple saws or saws on cranes. There's, it's amazing what, what, what equipment, what hydraulic oil can do now. Uh, and it's, uh, without protection measures, I think this 40% goal is, especially since 70% of all of these trees are on, you know, private property. I think that 40% goal is almost unobtainable if we don't protect the current mature trees that we have. I mean, I could more than happy to email a list of trees. I know that have been lost big mature trees just, uh, you know, for an addition for, they were dirty, um, you know, quote unquote dirty. And it's, I, I think to me. While I'm super appreciative for everything, everything that everyone has done for this program to date, I think this program is, is phenomenal. It's going to continue to be. I use it in my class at Columbus State. I um, hope there's no copyright issues there. Uh, that, you know, if we don't protect the trees that we have through, through permitting and even more so through licensing requirements, we're, we're kind of spinning wheels just because the tree loss is going to be just incredible in the, next, in the next decade. It's going to be absolutely incredible. It's already in the past 10 years is it's, it scares me personally, the amount of trees that, that we're losing just because there's absolutely no protections in place. Unlike many, many other states where have, you have to at least get a permit to remove a tree. Um, okay. Is that my three? Yep. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, but I'm more than happy to help in any, any regard at all uh, going forward. Um, I'm very passionate about, about, about tree cover. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate your in engagement and, and testimony. Um, Nathan Johnson, you are up, and um, Gail Smith, you are on deck. Mr. Johnson, you have uh, three minutes. President Pro Tem Brown, council members, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Nathan Johnson, and I'm the Public Lands Director for the Ohio Environmental Council and the OEC Action Fund. Uh, the mission of the OEC is to secure healthy air, land, and water for all who call Ohio home. Uh, we work across the state. We have offices across the state, but our home base is here in Columbus. Uh, and the OEC and the OEC Action Fund wish to offer our support for the Urban Forestry Master Plan. Uh, and, and this has been covered today, but the core goals of the plan uh, we feel are worthy, timely, and very much needed. Uh, Columbus is growing, and our urban forests should be growing along with it. And the master plan seeks to nearly double the city's tree canopy coverage. Uh, and as we know and have heard, growing the urban forest will help keep residents cool in the summer, make the air, the air cleaner, help control storm water, increase property values, store carbon, and improve overall public health and well being. Uh, increasing the, the city's tree canopy from 22 to 40 percent is a very strong goal. Uh, but given the urgency of climate change and the importance of public health, uh, the OEC does recommend that the plan include a timeline and achievement benchmarks to help ensure timely progress. Uh, the OEC also applauds the plan's focus on equity. The third goal of the master plan is to invest in equitable canopy across neighborhoods by 2030. And as the plan notes, canopy coverage in the city varies greatly depending on what neighborhood you're in. Uh, it's from a high of about 41% tree cover to a low of only about 9%. Uh, and so the plan seeks to grow the urban forest equitably by focusing most intently 
on the neighborhoods most in need. Uh, to achieve all of these goals, which are amazing goals, uh, the city is going to have to invest in the urban forestry program. And the plan identifies some key findings and recommendations in this regard. The OEC and OEC Action Fund encourage the city to make those investments. Uh, and finally, I'd like to comment on the quality of the plan for folks who have actually looked at it and read it. Um, they know what, what I'm mentioning, but it's highly detailed, it's comprehensive. Uh, the city's public engagement efforts have been really strong. Uh, so kudos to everyone involved with the plan's creation. Uh, and that's it from me and the OEC. Thank you so much. Thank you very much um, to the OEC and to you, uh, Mr. Johnson, for joining us. Gail Smith, you are um, up, and Steve Cockrell, you are on deck. Uh, Ms. Smith, are you there? If you're on, we can't hear you. She has been unmuted, council member. Okay. Well, um, then we um, are. We oh, Ms. Smith, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. And I'm truly grateful for the city of Columbus in this effort to maintain the forestry of this beautiful city. I am a resident of Columbus. And as a transplant from a concrete jungle myself and moving here to Columbus, Columbus has figuratively and literally been a breath of fresh air. Considering how many uh, people are so willing to pay just to live among or to see trees, deer and wildlife, then I'm glad to hear that Columbus is beginning to really appreciate the tremendous beauty and opportunities that are here at this time. After 17 years of living here, I have seen tremendous development and oftentimes improvements to the city. And it appears that the city is making preparations for an incoming population. There are several areas that are thriving, but there are still some that need some TLC. Today I'm speaking about the Bridgeview community in Columbus which encompasses Morse Road and then southerly to the Ohio Dominican University. Particularly Sunbury, Morse and Aguilar, Aguilar Roads and Cassidy Avenue. These areas have been fairly rich in natural forestry beauty with the Sunbury Road and the Elm Creek and kudos to the city for revamping and beautifying the Elm Creek Trail. My personal interest is that as a business property owner and a patron of the city of the uh, trail and of the Eastern Mall. My big concern today, however, is that over the past five years alone, I've seen hundreds of thousands of square feet of precious forestry that has been decimated in order to build hotels, to expand a, an expansive school campus in this area. And there's currently new construction that has uh, torn down at over 100,000 square feet to make room for a large warehouse. And I'm speaking of an area along Agler and Cassidy intersections. Along with it, it's brought increased traffic, increased speed limits, pollution, litter, increased traffic accidents, which caused destruction to a church sign. It damaged electric poles and there have been some injured people. Additionally, because of the misplaced wildlife resulting in several deer accidents, and I've seen several deers that are killed along the road just in the past couple of months. It's a very sad situation and site for Columbus. Now, overall, this has also increased the disregard for the natural beauty of this particular area and the lives that are, that are existing here. Meanwhile, to digress just for a moment, there are large commercial commercial areas such as the 340,000 plus square foot vacant value city, the Bill and S Roads. It's a huge eyesore that's been left from the past. And there's I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's that's ten minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you. I will I really, if I can, I will submit the rest of my concerns in writing. 
That would be great. Um, thank you so much for your participation. I really appreciate it. Um, next is Mr. Steve Cuthrell. I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, sir. And um, on deck is Brandy Whetstone. Thank you, President Pro Tem Brown and members of council for the opportunity to speak today about the Columbus Urban Forestry Master Plan. I am the vice chair of the Columbus Tree Subcommission, an advisory group that meets regularly with forestry staff to strengthen the city's forestry program. I have been an urban forestry professional for 35 years, including more than 30 years as a city forester. I'm also a certified arborist and municipal specialist and a past president of the Society of Municipal Arborists an international organization of urban foresters. Until my recent retirement, I spent 35 years with my office and or home in Columbus, so I feel a great affinity for the city. I'm delighted to see the master plan taking shape. The process has been handled with great skill by project manager Rosalie Hendon and the staff members who have been involved, and the consultants are top notch. My only regret is that this sort of plan was not crafted long ago. As the capital and largest city in Ohio, Columbus should and often does set an example for others, but I don't think that has been the case with urban forestry. This plan will help Columbus make up for lost time. Now, I'm particularly excited about the parts of the plan that call for incentivizing protection and retention of existing trees, better coordinating design, review, and construction processes to create more suitable growing spaces for trees, and planned, professionally managed care of existing trees on city property. Together, these steps will enable Columbus to transform its neighborhoods into more livable, healthier, and more sustainable communities. The right trees planted in well-designed spaces are an investment that appreciates in value for decades. Proactive maintenance of these valuable assets produces trees that live longer and maximizes the city's return on investment. Reactive tree care is constant crisis management. Planned pruning cycles of six to 10 years lead to dramatic decreases in emergency call-ins, longer tree lifespans, and increased public safety. The economic, environmental, and social benefits of urban trees are well documented, and this plan gives Columbus the opportunity to reverse the complex processes that have gradually created the alarming heat island and canopy deficit situations documented in the plan. To its credit, the plan also reflects and addresses some historic policies that led to long-term patterns of environmental inequity. I believe the plan will also offer many opportunities to establish better communication with and enhanced education of residents so that they may become more effective stewards, stewards and proponents of trees in their neighborhoods. Finally, the plan will open countless doors to new ideas and new partnerships with others who influence the city's canopy. The planning process itself has already opened some of those doors. Thanks again for accepting public comments today. I encourage the council to enthusiastically embrace this plan once it is completed and to bring urban forestry in Columbus up to 21st century standards. So the city is well positioned to attract and retain the residents, businesses, and institutions that make a vibrant city. Thank you so much for that testimony um, and your engagement. Uh, Brandy Whetstone, you are up, and Peggy Williams, you are on deck. Okay, great. Thank you, President Pro Tem Brown and members of City Council. My name is Brandi Whetstone. I serve as the Sustainability Officer at the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, where we provide programs, services, and funding related to transportation, land use, data, sustainability, and economic prosperity across a diverse 15-county region. I also served as a member of the Urban Forestry Master Plan Project Team, and I want to recognize all of the project leaders uh, for their organized, thoughtful, and data-driven approach that was informed by a, a thorough stakeholder and public engagement process. I also volunteered at the public open house early on, where there were a lot of interested residents packed in the room participating in conversations. So it's, it's been well received, and there's been a lot of great public outreach and engagement. Uh, the Central Ohio region continues to grow quickly and is on track to reach a population of 3 million people by 2050, and our challenge is to balance growth and development with natural resource protection to support a high quality of life for all residents. And trees provide so many benefits to communities in the form of clean air, clean water, flood mitigation, shade, and more. And we support this plan because the benefits add up to create a healthier, more resilient, and attractive region. 
The Columbus Urban Forestry Master Plan provides a long-term vision to prioritize, preserve, and grow the tree canopy in Columbus equitably across neighborhoods to improve health and quality of life for all residents. And this vision is aligned with MORPC's proposed regional sustainability agenda, which seeks to protect and preserve natural resources and create sustainable and equitable neighborhoods through strategies that include maintaining and expanding tree canopy. And the emphasis on equity is critical to ensure that all residents benefit from tree canopy. We learned through this process that tree canopy is not distributed equitably across Columbus, especially in historically disin disinvested neighborhoods where our more vulnerable residents live. And the long-term goal of the master plan is to achieve a 40% tree canopy cover, nearly doubling the current 22% coverage, bringing Columbus in line with other peer cities. I think setting a time horizon for reaching the 40% tree canopy cover will be important for creating the path forward and will help ensure that we're successful. We're committed to bringing together diverse individuals and communities across the region to support a common vision that advances sustainability, equity, and resilience. And through collaboration, we can align efforts around the goals of the Columbus Urban Forestry Master Plan to help improve and grow our tree canopy across the region. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide comment, and I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you so much for your engagement and your comment. Um, uh, Ms. Pegg, you are up, and Kamara Willoughby, you are on deck. Good afternoon, President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown and Council Members Shayla Favor and Emmanuel Raymond. I am Peggy Williams, a resident in the Linden community since 2001 residing at 1562 Cleveland Avenue. I have been serving as the secretary for the South Linden Area Commission for 10 years and zoning chair for the past two years. I consider myself to be an invested stakeholder committed to restoring the Linden's rich history as a gem location in the city of Columbus for families to live, worship, work, and play. Whenever I hear the name Linden, I want to be a part of whatever project is being implemented or researched to address and resolve disparities and or inequities in order to benefit my community. Such was the case with the Urban Forestry Master Plan. Because Linden ranked the highest in terms of the Social Equity Index, I became a part of the advisory group attending two of the three workshops held in 2019 before the coronavirus uh, pandemic in 2020, and there were some virtual meetings. Additionally, Linden, particularly our South neighborhood, was prioritized for the pilot street tree inventory and planting of 500 street trees. Learning that most of our trees grow on private property, I helped generate an educational video with the city to encourage residents to plant trees on their property. I named my maple tree Miss Mabel, planted September 2020. Becoming increasingly aware that many of the inequalities experienced by Linden stem from the former practice of redlining, I see increasing our tree canopy as one essential step towards embarking the new frontier of climate action planning with the potential of reducing our vulnerability to global warming. The Urban Forestry Master Plan promised to, one, cool down our neighborhoods, Two, improve our air quality by filtering pollution. Three, enhance our mental well-being. Four, extend our life expectancy 10 to 20 years. Raising property values and reducing energy costs are good benefits too. However, because I value people more than property, I will continue to support the Urban Forestry Master Plan and uh, with my involvement as implementation moves forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Pegg, um, for everything you do um, in, the, in the neighborhood and for your engagement in this process. Um, uh, Kamara Willoughby, Ms. Willoughby, you are up and on deck is Laura Fay. Hi, um, can everybody hear me? Um, we sure can. My name is Kamara Willoughby and I am a resident of the Milo Grogan community. 
Um, I and other neighbors love the idea of trees and understand the benefit of trees. Some um, other neighbors understand the benefit, but do not want to be faced with the cost that, you know, we've discussed in this call um, or during this hearing. Um, and, you know, something as small as, you know, raking leaves for someone who's elderly or handicapped can be, you know, a huge concern. Um, you know, when so the, the care, having a care plan um, in place, you know, for these trees and for the lifetime of these trees is extremely important. Um, again, educating people about the uh, taking care of trees. Um, and I know that funding is a factor, but also just thinking of uh, a lot of creative ways that uh, caring for a tree can be implemented, maybe have an annual uh, tree education workshops in neighborhoods. Um, and I'm, I read in the plan that, uh, you know, you guys are be going to be connecting with Park and Recs, you know, Park and Recs can implement a tree planting program so that kids can be educated on how to plant trees and be able to plant trees, you know, during the season to plant the trees um, in their communities. You know, just these, these small things and, um, having uh, residents with that education be able to take ownership of uh, these trees and you know and getting a buy-in from the ones who, who are kind of discouraged from getting trees though there's a benefit there um, i personally love trees um, i remember um, you know i grew up loving trees but i remember visiting my friend in cleveland and we were driving down this road and you know it's some of you might have been able to experience this but I was, you know, just had my hand out the head out the window and the air was just it was just so clean. It was I, I can't describe, but it was it, it felt so good to breathe that air. It was just so fresh um, and it was because there was so many trees in that area. Um, and so, you know, the plan, I think, does a great job of laying out all the benefits of trees um, and some some things cannot be measured by numbers. Um, you know, someone mentioned mental mental health, and that's that's very important. Um, as in addition to the environmental benefits, um, so thank you for this space to speak, and um, thank you for allowing us to, you know, address our loving concerns for this project. Ms. Willoughby, thank you. Um, that was uh, really great feedback, and um, on the opportunity in front of us, but then also, you know, we need to be eyes wide open on the challenges that some residents face uh, as we implement this plan. So, um, you know, Rosalie, I, I know that those are things that are on your mind, but um, it's a good good note to take um, as well as we work towards implementation. Um, Laura Fay, you are up and Joe Reedy, you are on deck. Hi. Hi. Good evening. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for allowing Flo to be part of the advisory group for the Urban Forestry Master Plan. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, support the goal of prioritizing future tree planting based on social equity and the goal of increasing the canopy from 22 to 40 percent. But we do think the goal of reducing the net loss uh, needs to be shortened from 2030. And losing those large mature trees <clears throat> is going to be difficult to replace. It's just going to make the work we have to do harder. And it's going to be harder on people of lower income that can't afford air conditioning bills that are increasing and things like that. So, um, and then we also support tree canopy planning because besides the uh, numerous benefits for people. It also is invaluable in the watershed and it supports a lot of our food web, our birds, um, our insects and things like that. Uh, we're excited that the plan addresses climate change and possibly planting trees that are different than we currently plant um, based on changing temperatures and survivability and also addresses urban heat island. Uh, we would like to see some more innovative solutions for areas with high density and narrow tree lawns. Currently, the plan suggests allowing just off-site planting, 
but that doesn't necessarily help the people that live near those high density areas or those areas with small tree lawns. Um, <clears throat> and we would like to see a reduced number of variances from developers um, that try and reduce the number of tree plantings that you currently require um, uh, based on their hardship. So, um, and then Flo would like to see uh, maybe a change from the focus on the education being done by the proposed tree coalition to uh, resort to the Department of Neighborhoods. They have a, a weekly or monthly relationships with <clears throat> uh, the um, civic associations or neighborhood associations. And you need that kind of relationship to have them trust you and, and listen to what you're saying. So we'd like them more involved. Uh, we'd like to see more native trees grown at the city nursery <clears throat> and planted by your contractors. And currently um, the trees being grown at the city nursery are 30% non-native. Uh, that doesn't necessarily, like I said, help support our food web that's important in the watershed. Uh, Columbus is an important part of the flyway. Uh, of uh, birds migrating, monarch butterflies and others that migrate. Um, so we need to support them. And then we'd like to see strong leadership from the city of Columbus departments to plant uh, the public areas, the right-of-ways. And that's because those areas are impervious surfaces. They're adding to the urban heat island and tree canopy over them can uh, provide shade. Uh, intercept stormwater and things like that. And currently only 16% of the right of way is planted. So that's how you guys can help. And we'd like to see that focus. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we appreciate your engagement overall. Um, Joe Reedy, you are up. And John uh, Lathrum, you are on deck. President Pro Tem Brown, um, Council Members Faber and Remy, thank you for the opportunity to offer comments on the new or urban forestry master plan. I'm a 32 year, year resident of Clintonville and the Vice President of Development and Director of Environmental Services at Thrive Companies, better known as Wagonbrenner Development. As a longtime resident of Columbus and a member of the real estate development community, I was happy to be invited to be a member of the project team and have the opportunity to participate in the development of the master plan and provide feedback along the way. The urban forestry master plan is important to our city as it is the first comprehensive plan created for Columbus's trees, especially given the importance of encouraging, protecting and maintaining trees, both on public property and on private property. But this is just the first step. We need to act on this plan and commit the necessary resources to make it happen. Trees in Columbus are critical to our communities. While they have important environmental and public health benefits, they are also an important amenity to our communities. It's no accident that the word park is part of the name of many of my company's developments as we look to construct parks as part of our projects where there aren't already one. But it's also uh, to choose sites along rivers, like our projects at Harrison Park and Founders Park along the Olentangy River and quarry trails along the Scioto River. In the planning of our developments, we know trees and green space are important to not only the residents of our projects, but also to the surrounding community. We regularly work with the city to create new community authorities to establish a public-private partnership for the construction and maintenance of the green spaces associated with our projects. For example, just two weeks ago, we worked with the City of Columbus Department of Recreation and Parks and a private contractor to clear invasive brush and dead trees along the Olentangy River on the east side um, of the river between Fifth Avenue and Third Avenue is part of the development of the new Perry Street Park in the Harrison West neighborhood. We are also working with the city and Franklin County Metro Parks on the development of the new Quarry Trails Metro Park, especially on the dedication of a two mile stretch of the Scioto River corridor as part of the new park. 
As other speakers have said, mature trees are an important part of the character of uh, our city and especially my Clintonville neighborhood. It was one of the reasons why my wife and I bought our home there in 1979 and have stayed ever since. It's truly painful when we lose these important natural assets to road or utility construction, and it's important to take steps to protect them. More specifically, we, while it's been great to have uh, our streets paved recently, as that work's been being done, Huge mature trees in the tree lawns adjacent to these. New Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Reedy. Uh, we appreciate your uh, work across the city and engagement on this issue. And um, please uh, feel free to also submit any um, uh, written comments too. Thank you. Um, next is John Lathram and uh, Tyler Stevenson. You're on deck. Thank you. I'm President Pro Temp Brown and members of council. Uh, my name is John Latham. I chair the North Linden Area Commission. Um, I've lived here since 1995. I can attest I have two and a half city lots um, that are joined together and I have 17 trees on my property and it does reduce the amount of time I use my air conditioner in the summer. And this weekend I'll be planting three more so I can get up to 20 trees. But that said, um, I would like to suggest that we encourage any developers that are moving um, into areas such as um, North and South Linden to implement a um, canopy program within their development. I'm working with um, Homeport and Habitat, um, Next Generation, and those groups have cut down mature trees on Myrtle Avenue and along Cleveland Avenue. So I would like to see a program implemented um, to encourage uh, more green space with developers. I am excited to see in the um, master plan that Cleveland Avenue was looked at. And my concern is um, for, for, again, it's been brought up private folks of just maintenance of these trees, leaf gathering. As I said, with all my trees, I spend a lot of time having Rumpy, Rumpy come out and pick up debris for me, but it often sits there for um, weeks on end. Um, so we, we do need to um, consider that. And I do, um, as Councilman Remy had mentioned, I like the idea of um, jobs within the community, a community benefits agreement, um, citizen arborists, um, groups that will come along and take care of the trees, take care of the leaf and um, leaf removal. And that is all I have to say today. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, Mr. Lathram. Um, Tyler, and for everything that you do in the community too. Um, Tyler Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson, you are up, and Joshua Simon, you are on deck. Hello, President Pro Tem Brown and council members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I am the Urban Forestry Program Manager for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Forestry. Um, our six regional urban foresters provide Ohio's municipalities and allied agencies with uh, technical and organizational assistance to manage their urban forest resource uh, with the ultimate goal of developing sustainable urban forestry programs. Uh, first, I would like to commend the city of Columbus for taking this necessary step in managing their, their resource by developing an urban forest master plan and echo some of the comments that were mentioned earlier from Nathan and Stephen about what a well-prepared plan it is and what a, a great team they've assembled, uh, the consultants and, and the project team to put this plan together. It's it's a very well, well thought out and well-prepared plan. Um, and ODNR fully supports the plan and we're, we're available to further assist with implementation and whatever eff efforts uh, you see uh, that where we can fit in on it. Um, I think I can speak for most agencies and organizations and disciplines when I say the importance of strategic planning cannot be stressed enough. Uh, particularly when managing a natural resource that affects and is affected by so many other public and private entities, entities and organizations. Um, so while, while all of the action items in there are important to reach the goals that Rosalie covered earlier, I'd, I'd like to use my time to just highlight one of the action items that I feel is critically important for the city to consider, and that's the action item 12, expanding the size and scope of the urban forestry leadership. Um, our program recently conducted an informal study uh, to help determine which factors contribute most to effective urban forestry programs in Ohio. And our results show that the most successful programs employ or consult professional urban foresters, 
with technical expertise to manage the resource effectively and efficiently through plans like that have been developed here through these strategic planning efforts. Um, and these, these findings correlate with what our urban foresters have anecdotally experienced over the past 40 years of working with all sizes of communities in Ohio, whether it's small com communities consulting with us or hiring a part-time consulting foresters to the larger communities that typically have a professional degreed forester on staff to lead the program. Um, Rosalie mentioned the, the visit, vision statement earlier as well. Um, we, we have a shared vision of, of an improved quality of life uh, for Columbus residents, for all Ohioans. And we feel that that can only really be achieved when these comprehensive urban forestry programs are integrated and on par with other community services. Uh, we, we often compare the management of green infrastructure in our communities to the gray infrastructure. Um, we understand the importance of, of a city engineer and the, the planning and designing and oversight of projects, the, the direction of activities, all the important work that a city manager does. Um, it, we know that, that it's an incredibly, a critically important pos position for, for this important infrastructure. And we feel like the green infrastructure is also critically important to the health and well-being of your residents and deserves a caliber of, of uh, a position that, that can oversee all of that. Uh, and it, it's well laid out in the plan that uh, is, is before you there. So the plan you have there, it's it's a roadmap to achieving. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Stevenson, and uh, thank you to ODNR and you for um, engaging in that process. <laughs> Joshua Simon, you are up, and Rachel Wagner, you are on deck. Currently, work for Columbus and Franklin County Metro Parks. I first became involved with the Columbus Urban Forest Master Plan when I met Kerry Gray from David Tree and Urban Canopy Works team about a year and a half ago. And I came interested in this plan. I was so grateful to be a part of it. And just previous to my experience here at Metro Parks and my experience as a graduate student, it's two things I want to kind of point out as the real opportunity things for us is they mentioned with 70% of the tree canopy located on private property, we must engage property owners in all steps of the process. And also with the need of more human power of physical support hopefully we can activate volunteers and or hire from communities that we need to engage the most and i think it's kind of shows us opportune time we can kind of grow the the what the urban forestry program looks like here in columbus but also train young people who are looking for new types of jobs especially as the green industry continues to grow and people are looking for more opportunities to get involved I think that's a good plan to really engage the communities that really need to be equitable as we're planting these trees. And also just a way to make sure that we're connecting with the community to let them know that this is important and the reasons we are doing this urban forestry plan. With my background in urban forestry, but it's my bachelor's degree, my bachelor's degree is in, I think this is a great plan to be a part of and I'm really excited and hopefully Columbus and um, the surrounding areas could help out with this plan and looking forward to what it looks like in the future and years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Simon, for engaging in um, all, all the work with Metro Parks. <laughs> um, I am sorry. Uh, uh, Rachel Wagner. <laughs> Can't seem to clear my throat. Rachel Wagner, um, you are up, yeah. and Danielle Dillard, you're on deck. Oh, okay. All right. Hello, Council Member Elizabeth Brown and members of Columbus's Recreation and Parks Department. Thank you for having this hearing today. My name is Rachel Wagner, and I volunteer with Ready for 100, a campaign for clean energy and climate justice. I believe trees are an essential component of mitigating the risks of climate change, uh, and city policies are also essential. And as we've learned today, Columbus can do more to increase and maintain a denser urban forest. I would love to see Columbus reach the status of some of its peer cities with a 40% or more tree canopy. Uh, I've also been looking at the tree canopy goals and the climate action plan, uh, and I know that these will be the same goals as the urban forest goals presented today. Uh, in Columbus's climate action plan, the goal is to have a minimum 12% tree canopy in all neighborhoods by 2030. Um, now that number is 9% right now, and the 2050 goal in the climate action plan is to bring that 12% minimum up to 40%. Um, so I'm looking at it, it's, you know, nine years, raise the bottom bar, 3%. Um, that leaves a 29% increase in trees to be handled after 2030. Um, so this 
doesn't quite add up. I think our goals for tree canopy need to be more ambitious between now and 2030. Um, you know, maybe let's say bringing 9% up to 19% by then. Uh, now I understand that tree canopy losses need to be addressed first. Um, the zoning codes are being overhauled. Currently in the urban forestry master plan states the need for tree protection policies. Um, I think that's great. I strongly suggest municipal code, which requires green infrastructure and tree planting for all new development. Uh, new development can bring economic growth, but there are so many things that cost our city, including damages caused by flooding, poor air quality, people suffering heat strokes. Um, these things will get worse if we don't act strategically. Um, and trees save money for our city and residents. This is something that's covered in the plan. Um, and for the businesses heading the development, you know, let's recoup those costs. Um, after reviewing Columbus's urban forestry master plan, I believe that right away we need to take funding and staff resources seriously. I also think that within the next one to two years, uh, we'll need to be nailing down a lot of things, including what the Columbus Tree Coalition will be since it doesn't exist yet. Uh, and I've noticed in many cities, there's a nonprofit with paid staff to help with tree responsibilities. And as laid out in the urban forest plan, the Columbus Tree Coalition will create messaging, educational resources, urban tree progress reports, and establish an information hub online. Uh, these duties are not suited to members of the community who will have significant time constraints. Um, so how many paid staff can Columbus fund to maintain the urban forest, communicate with residents, uh, and provide education. Yeah, funding is going to be key. That's my final point. I am sharing additional resources about <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be filling out the form online where you are taking feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Wagner. Um, and completely agree that um, policy um, and funding and also making sure our goals are aggressive enough are, are really key. Um, if we're ever going to reach that at 40 percent. Um, next, we have um, Danielle Dillard and um, Klaus Eckert. You're on deck. Um, hello, my name is Danielle Dillard and I am a commissioner on the Livingston Avenue Area Commission and I'm a resident of the Driving Park neighborhood. Um, I just want to start off by saying it was really great to work with Rosalie and participate um, in the advisory group meetings. And it was also just nice to work with her to find residents in my area that were interested in planting private trees on their properties. Um, I'm not sure where urban forestry plans to begin the process of planting trees, but I think as the city looks to that, um, there's a really wonderful opportunity to start that process by planting a lot of public trees um, along the Livingston Avenue corridor. Um, this is a major thoroughfare in Columbus and we have a severely underdeveloped canopy. Um, and we've really seen a lot of fast paced and promising development in our area. And I think it only makes sense to further beautify and bolster, bolster the area through the addition of some really substantial forest type public trees, um, like both along Livingston Avenue um, in Driving Park, and then within the various tree lawns throughout our corridor. Um, we have Blueprint we have Blueprint Columbus currently working in our area to solve water runoff issues. And I think that presents a great opportunity for urban forestry to come in and create uh, some sunken tree lawns and plant trees along with some of the proposed rain gardens in order to increase the canopy. Um, so I hope that the city will really consider starting some of these initiatives in our area. I think it would just really help out with being very impactful and and help boost some much needed economic development in our area as, as well as just give some general beautification to it i think that would really go a long way great thank you danielle um i i thank you for lifting up livingston avenue that's a great call out for an area that um trees would just um really benefit um klaus eckert you are up, and Mary Jo. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Hi, my name is Klaus Eckert. I'm the executive director of Green Columbus. We organize Earth Day Columbus, and this year we will be planting and distributing a record 65,000 plus trees.
Unfortunately, the majority of these trees will be planted outside of Columbus. I thank President Pro Temp Brown and Councilmember Remy for this opportunity to speak. I'm in support of a comprehensive, actionable urban forestry master plan with science-based goals and time horizons that lead to significantly increased and more equitable urban canopy coverage. The situation of our urban forest is not great and prognosis without intervention is poor. The urban forests, unlike natural forests, need human support and significant investments in maintenance. To me, this is a key responsibility of a local government that cares about its people. That is why I am grateful for Rosalie and team that led to this effort to develop a UFMP. I'd like to quickly compare Columbus to Louisville. They're somewhat similar sized cities. They face similar problems like a declining canopy coverage and rising urban heat island. We have comparable tree benefits data because Davy Trees were the consultants for both cities. These are the facts. In 2019, Columbus had 879,000 inhabitants and around 22% canopy coverage. Louisville had 618,000 people and around 37% canopy coverage. According to Davy Trees, Columbus's urban forest provides approximately $38 million in benefits every year. Also, according to Davy, Louisville trees provide $390 million annually in benefits per person. That's $43 a year in Columbus compared to $630 per person per year in Louisville. That's almost 15 times the tree benefits in Louisville per person compared to Columbus. Here's my question. Why is the city of Columbus not doing everything possible to provide this level of benefits to its citizens? One simple solution, invest heavily in trees. Why don't we start with $25 per person per year? That's less than seven cents a day per person. Let's start a plan on public land to demonstrate that the city is serious about trees for all the major benefits. Aren't we all worth seven cents a day for a healthier, greener, better city? That would allow the city to spend $22 million a year to plant 30,000 street and park trees, reforest dozens of acres with tree seedlings, and increase our tree maintenance drastically. In regards to the UFMP, I second the need to provide strong tree protection measures, but not in 2030, right now, in 2021. We cannot afford to continue to lose more canopy. I like the 40% goal a lot, but it needs a time horizon. Trees take 12 to 20 years, so if you want to have a significantly larger canopy coverage by 2050, when being outside and without shade will be unbearable on many days, we need to put the trees in by 2030. We don't have much time. Let's start with seven cents per person per day. Let's start in public property. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The best, second best time is right now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Klaus, and um, every, for everything Green Columbus does too. Uh, Mary Jo Napoli, you are up, and um, Nicholas Stanek, you are on deck. Thank you, President Pro Tem, council members, and city leaders. This plan correctly notes the number one benefit from tree canopy is cleaner air and its resulting health. But the plan does not consider the significant excess air pollution in certain Northwest Columbus residential and shopping areas from the OSU airport, such as the Sawmill Road takeoff zone. Some airplane pollution, the deadly particulate matter 2.5, can sit there or can travel for miles. Additionally, the new Northwest Corridor Transportation Plan will send a constant fleet of buses through main streets, which could add immense additional pollution. And a second point, the plan is deficient because it's based on the 2013 or current tree canopy, but massive changes have occurred and are planned in the future in increased density levels for Northwest Columbus. Our, this first to be implemented city corridor uh, is going to have greatly reduced tree canopy because of the density increases. I thank you again and I'll submit the rest of the comments in writing. Uh, thank you so much for your feedback and, um, and uh, your perspective from the Northwest Civic. Would love to, um, again, my email address is ecbrown at columbus.gov, and um, we'd love to help uh, sort through some of those things with you over email too, um, as we're working on these final stages of public comment. Uh, also, I will do another reminder at the end of the program, but I should have been doing this throughout. 
um, just reminding anyone who's listening or anyone who has commented that the um, comment period is open till the 31st of this month. And so that's one week from today. And the plan can be reviewed with written comments submitted at columbusufmp.org. I'll say that again at the end, but <clears throat> I apologize. I should have been reminding throughout. Um, so next is um, Nicholas Stanek and Marion Lupo. You are on deck. Council member, I do not have Nicholas uh, listed in our attendees. Okay. okay. Um, then Marion Lupo, if you um, are there, we'd love to hear from you. And then Catherine Moore would be on deck. I apologize, council member. I do not show Marion Lupo okay. in attendance at this time. Okay. Then Catherine Moore. Hello. Hi, Catherine, you can go ahead and David Roseman, you're on deck. Thank you. President Pro Tem Brown, Council Members Favor and Remy and Director Rakowski, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. My name is Catherine Moore and I'm a volunteer with the Friends of Schiller Park. We are excited and invigorated by the renewed focus on urban forestry in Columbus. We salute the work of the Recreation and Parks Department, the leadership of Council Member Brown and Mayor Ginther, and the support of additional members of City Council. There is an anonymous saying, quote, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now, unquote. The Urban Forest Plan is a remarkable tool. Thank you for investing in a project that none of us will live to see completed. What an act of faith and vision. I am speaking this afternoon as a champion of our park system, which accounts for an important portion of this aspirational plan. The Recreation and Parks Department is facing a COVID triple threat. The city budget is severely stressed. Permit fees from athletic programs and special events have been near zero over the last year. And the department is incurring new expenses because of the coronavirus like personal protective equipment for staff. The parks have been sanctuaries for the public throughout the pandemic, and the demands for routine maintenance have increased with the traffic. Currently, there is not even one forestry crew dedicated to our 529 public parks. In cases of emergency, a crew is pulled off the street, street tree detail to address the need but nobody is acting proactively to maintain the trees in our parks and to ensure that they live a full lifespan. If we are to build a livable, resilient, and socially connected city as we continue to grow in population and density, then we must invest in our parks, and not just by building new parks, but in the money and city staff to keep them as beautiful as they were the day the ribbon was cut, whether that was five years ago or 150 years ago. The urban forestry plan will be adopted with little hope of full funding. Wherever you have to draw the line initially, please be sure that Columbus public park trees are drawn in rather than left out. We look forward to working with the city to support this comprehensive program to realize the goal of increasing our tree canopy as well as ensuring the health of every tree planted. To realize these transformational enhancements, the funding must be increased many fold. To reap the benefits of mature trees in our city, there must be a steady long-term commitment to them. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comment on the urban forestry plan. Thank you so much, Ms. Moore. Um, next, uh, and for your engagement overall and, um, and strong words about the plan. Next, we have David Roseman. And um, Kathy Cohen-Becker, you are on deck. Hi, good evening, Council Pro Tem President Brown and family, uh, Council Member Ramey, Rec and Parks leaders, staff, and guests. David Roseman here. I'm Vice President of Friends of Allen Creek and Tributaries and a 40-year uh, Columbus resident. Since 1998, our nonprofit FACT mission is to preserve and protect the quality and beauty of the Lower Allen Creek watershed. For over 20 years, FACT has provided thousands of volunteer hours and monies to Columbus Recreation and Parks and other municipalities 
with our tree plantings, invasive species removal, such as honeysuckle, uh, green restoration initiatives, and multitude of trash cleanups. And uh, we removed the first two low head dams uh, in Franklin County from out of the Allen Creek. A uh, fact applause and congratulates all involved for drafting a thorough, well documented study and extensive plan, which we highly support. Uh, FACT strongly agrees with two findings. Uh, number 14, uh, addressing volunteer tree planting and care activities. And number 16, implementing preservation policies to protect trees on private properties. FACT also supports the many calls for actions, specifically focusing on three of those. Number 11, funding. Number 14, private tree protection. Number 15, improved public tree protection. I'd like to call your attention to some unfortunate challenges that we've experienced that we hope can be addressed sooner than later by city councils and leaders. Uh, number one, uh, significantly increase the capital budget, which I understand is about 1 million a year to acquire more public preserved land and green space. As others have commented, we're finding a losing battle. Um, how can we increase canopy when we can barely save what little we have? Uh, adding typical landscape sick trees do little to make up for mature large trees. Uh, and the city's tree replacement formula is unfortunately outdated and faulty, and that needs to be revised based upon the carbon capture formulas. Uh, Columbus Recreation Parks changed policies for volunteer groups, such as FACT, that has really curtailed our efforts to provide services for Columbus. So we've shifted to working in other municipalities. Uh, Columbus Recreation and Parks continues to design and build wonderful greenway trail systems, but most result in removing miles of wide swaths of forested woodlands, wetlands, and riparian corridor. Let's route these along less sensitive adjacent areas, such as roadways that have no sidewalks by partnering with Department of Public Services Transportation. How can we ask private property owners to preserve when we can't lead ourselves by example? We have seen large native trees, city trees, removed by Department of Public Services because adjacent damaged sidewalks need to be replaced. Those need to be, there needs to be a more creative sidewalk fixes to allow trees to remain, such as using asphalt or rubber mats versus concrete. Just in time. Thank you for today's opportunity to learn more and share our comments about the Columbus Forestry Plan. Thank you so much and thank you for what FACT does um, and the constructive feedback, which I hope you are also submitting um, uh, as comment to the plan. Kathy Cohen-Becker, you are up and Carla Ruffin, you are on deck. Great, can you hear me? We sure can. Great, um, so President Pro Tem Brown and members of Columbus City Council, thank you so much for holding this hearing on the Columbus Urban Forestry Master Plan. My name is Kathy Cowan Becker and I'm chair of Ready for 100 in Ohio and the new executive director of Simply Living in Columbus. So the Urban Forestry Master Plan is a comprehensive tree management document long overdue in Columbus and we commend the city for seriously considering the tree canopy and devoting the resources to outline the current status, challenges, benefits, goals and action plans for the urban forest of Columbus. As the plan notes, other cities are way ahead of us, but if we implement the recommendations of this plan, we can catch up. To achieve the goals of the Urban Forestry Master Plan, we need to act on three principles, equity, protection, and funding. So first, equity. As the plan shows, the urban forest is not equi equitably spread across the city. Many neighborhoods, such as Westland, where I live, have a low tree canopy cover. Fewer trees are correlated with lower household incomes, higher health problems, and higher crime rates. So we're glad to see the equitable tree canopy by 2030, by 2030 as a goal of the plan. Planting trees in areas with low tree cover is important, not just for the environment, but also the people. But the priority planting map doesn't always seem to correspond to the areas where there is low tree canopy and low social equity. For example, Westland is shown as low priority on the priority planting map, yet it only has a 13% tree canopy and low social equity. So second, protection. As the plan notes, Columbus has virtually no management of its current tree canopy and no protection for the trees we do have. 
Stopping net canopy loss will require creating ordinances that provide protection for trees, especially on private property. We would like to see this happen well before 2030. Related to this is protecting green space and community gardens. Columbus is growing and development pressure is intense. Cleveland has a special zoning designation to protect urban farms. Columbus needs to look comprehensively at its planning and zoning to protect trees, green space, and community gardens in the face of pressure to develop. And finally, funding. If we're to get Columbus to a 40% tree canopy, we need resources. The urban forest has been consistently underfunded in Columbus and that needs to change. The current Columbus urban forest brings 38 million in benefits to our city each year and expanding it will only expand the benefits. The change we would like to see to this goal is to add a goal year with milestones. For example, if we want to get to a 40% tree canopy by 2050, then we need to get to 25 to 30% citywide by 2030. If we don't have a goal year that everyone is working toward, then it will be too easy for the work to be deprioritized in future budgets. So thank you again for this opportunity to testify about the Urban Forestry Master Plan, and we're excited to see where this leads. Thank you so much um, for that testimony and your uh, engagement um, in lifting up those issues. Carla is here um, on behalf of the Recreation and Parks Commission, I think. I am. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. You know, going last is awesome because I get to learn from all of the smart people, people that are way smarter than I am, that are so passionate about trees. And so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carla Rothen. I'm speaking here on behalf of the Columbus Recreation and Parks Commission. I've served on the commission since 2007 and have in the past year stepped into the role as the president of our Columbus Recreation and Parks Foundation, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. I have been a resident of the city for 35 years and I served as a nonprofit leader uh, for over 12 years as the director of Stonewall Columbus. So when Mr. Roseman started talking about the sidewalks, um, I had already had this plant story that I was going to tell you, but it just re-emphasized it for me. Uh, you know, when I was the director there, we had a very vibrant uh, senior program and we would take our seniors out for outings um, at the community center and we were in the short north there. Um, and at, right outside of our door at the opening to the center was a sidewalk with a beautiful tree and the roots had grown so that they they basically grew through the concrete and they made it a little bit unsafe. One of our seniors tripped, they had to go to the ER. They were fine, they ended up being okay and that was great. But it got me thinking even back then, why was that tree planted here? Obviously that didn't work here. What was happening, right? So when I was asked to be uh, a person that would serve on the um, the, the committee um, as, a, as a member of our commission, sit on the committee for the urban forestry master plan, I, I was so honored and I learned so much. Um, and I was very passionate about it as well. And so I think what one of the things that I learned is that we really need to make more of, um, of a plan for spaces that hold trees. So, so you know, part of the, the strategic plan for our department, and I'm so proud of, of, of Rosalie and her team and, and, and the consultants that created this plan, is, you know, what are we looking at as far as creating more green space? You know, part of our uh, the department's strategic plan is that, and this definitely falls under, under hitting that goal, is to make sure that no one in the city is 10 minute, a 10 minute walk away from a, a, a city park. Um, such an important thing when you're talking about equity and access that we all have access to this. And then another, on another note, um, I'm the president of the foundation, uh, and I'm going to put a, a, my hat on there because our executive director and our board are very committed to, uh, to, to this, of course, urban forestry plan, but also to the department and helping to raise the resources and the funding and the grants and the public and private partnerships that actually will help to pay for this. And I know that that is something everybody was concerned about. You know, we we have these great, you know, wild ideas and we want to make all this change, right? But how are we going to pay for it? Well, we're all going to come together and help. And I think our foundation is poised for that moment. So I'm, I'm really pleased about that. But, you know, today what we're doing is we're not asking uh, council to endorse this plan or fund this plan. What we're saying is we want you to just support it. And the reason we need you to support is because we're going to come back to you with code changes. We're going to come back to you with legislation. 
And we're going to say, we're your partner in this too. You know, our citizens want it. And so um, we want to thank you and just ask for your support. The end. Well, and I made it. Thank you so much, Carla, for <clears throat> closing us out so perfectly. Um, and we appreciate the engagement of the commission in this effort. You're obviously the representative of that um, and the coming collaboration um, with the support of the foundation. So um, I am going to give um, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Remy, an opportunity to say anything if um, you'd like at the close of the hearing, council member, um, or to ask any questions, you know, of the presenters based on testimony here tonight. Are you good? Oh, I, 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 well, I'll just say um, I appreciate the hearing this evening, President Pro Tem Brown, uh, March 4th last year. I was happy to join the public hearing, uh, the open house. And it's just unbelievable. It's been over a year, but obviously the, the work that's been put into this. Thank you, Rosalie, uh, for all of your hard work and dedication, the Rex and Park staff, the consultants, all of those that have put the work and effort into this. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, we stand ready to support and to uh, work towards these goals and finding ways, uh, some creative and, and, and aggressive to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we work expeditiously to get this accomplished. So thanks again, and uh, I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you, council member. And I know that the, uh, you know, as has been mentioned, and as you mentioned, the climate action plan and this really do have some key overlap. And um, we appreciate the collaboration between, on the tree issue between your committee and my committee. Um, and uh, it is funny to think about, I, I think one of my last pre, pre pandemic events was a large gathering for, for the um, urban forestry master plan. So, um, well, thank you anyone, everyone for being here. I really appreciate the presenters for um, uh, such great content. And um, I know this will not be the last time we hear from you um, and work with you. And I know that um, you may be at our council meeting when we, when we pass our resolution. But in the meantime, everyone listening, before any of that can happen, um, we need you to continue to provide public comment online. Um, if you'd like to submit anything that you talked about in written form, um, that public comment period is open through one week from today, March 31st. Um, it can be, the plan can be reviewed and then those comments can be submitted at columbusufnp.org. Um, so thank you again to our speakers um, and also to my colleagues for joining us. I hope everyone has a lovely evening Go outside, um, have your dinner outside, hopefully near a tree um, uh, to get that nice shade uh, that it provides in our environment. And um, there is a great deal of work ahead. Um, so thank you so much for being a part of this um, chapter of it. We'll see you later.